Yumalundi. I would also like to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Let me start by acknowledging um, the elders that are in the room today. Um, and in addition, the chair of IATSIS, uh, Professor Michael McDaniel, um, CEO Craig Ritchie, Deputy CEO Letitia Hope, and uh, Craig's uh, renowned predecessor, Russ Taylor. But let me also um, pay my respects to you, the broader uh, IATSIS community. It's with considerable humility that I stand here today uh, feeling somewhat of an imposter uh, amongst the impressive array of Wentworth, alumni of Wentworth lecturers. Uh, it's a roll call of names synonymous with the pursuit of Indigenous rights and reconciliation in Australia. Davis, Kirby, French, Tonkinson, Mulvaney, Langton, Dodson among them. While I address you today as someone who is both now a participant um, in Indigenous affairs, I have primarily been an observer over the course of my career. Clearly, I'm not someone who spent my career observing and writing on Indigenous history, culture and thought. So I hope that you'll take my comments as an honest attempt to describe the situation as I see it. First and foremost, I'm an economist, someone who spent most of their working life poring over economic data at the Australian Treasury and the IMF. So what do I see when I look at the landscape of Indigenous affairs, at both the historic and cur current policy debates, and when I think about the challenges going forward? First, I'm struck by how often the discussion is framed in terms of deficit and failure, not strength and success. Second, it puzzles me that so little distinction seems to be drawn between different communities, even different individuals, when we consider the aspirations and needs of Indigenous Australians. And thirdly, how historically, but even today in some quarters, Indigenous affairs is seen through a social welfare lens rather than an economic empowerment one. Perhaps it's, <coughs> excuse me, perhaps it's because I am an economist that my policy brain is conditioned to start from wanting to get the framework and the fundamentals right. Knowing that the pursuit of economic empowerment can never be separated from the social and cultural dimensions of people's lives. But it is economic empowerment that gives people the freedom to live the lives that they value. To draw an analogy, no country in the history of humanity ever lifted itself out of poverty by the, receipt, by the simple receipt of aid. Aid can help at the margin, but ultimately all success comes on the back of economic growth. So why would we expect economic, social and cultural health for Indigenous Australia to come solely through welfare? As head of the APS, and head of the agency responsible for improving the lives and well-being of Australia's First Peoples. I've had cause to reflect on these issues a lot over the last year and a half. And I'm going to keep coming back to these observations through the course of today's discussion. But what I'd really like to do is to build my remarks around two primary points, both of which stem from the success of the 1967 referendum, which Bill Wentworth played uh, such a pivotal part. Firstly, I'll delve into the challenges posed by the way the APS has traditionally operated, asking whether the public service itself needs a deeper capacity to address the problems of and the underlying causes of disadvantage if we're to address the challenges that remain. And secondly, I'll discuss the legacy of the inclusion of Indigenous Australians in the National Census, and that is data. The results of the 67 referendum have been especially front of mind this year as we've looked back on some remarkable moments in Australia's reconciliation history. It's 20 years since the handing down of the Bringing Them Home report, 25 years since the historic Mabo decision, 
and half a century since that 67 referendum yes vote, which in the words of Senator Pat Dodson, was the point at which this country awoke from almost two centuries of sleep. Back in May, I had the privilege of sitting in the House of Representatives chamber alongside many of the original 67 campaigners and their families to hear the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition reflect on that moment of 50 years ago. It was indescribably moving to feel the emotion of the guests around me as they heard their history honoured. I marvelled then, as I still do now, at their resilience, endurance and humility. Later that day, I had the opportunity to spend a few hours with other stalwarts of that campaign. Dr Gordon Briscoe, Dr Robert Anderson, Eileen Perkins, Dr Barry Pittock and others. And still later in that week, in Melbourne, I watched the film of Sir Doug Nichols taking his fold-up card table and his camp chair to sit in the street and patiently explain to all who would listen why a yes vote was so important. Those Australians fought persistently for truth and justice and their tireless demonstration of what Jackie Huggins has called courage for good was finally rewarded with definitive and permanent constitutional change. So the question for people like me to address in events like this is how far have we taken this change? What have we learnt half a century down the path of Commonwealth Public Administration of Indigenous Affairs? Contrary to the deficit mindset, it is clear that legal and statistical recognition has broadly translated into better opportunities and better outcomes for First Australians. Deputy Secretary in my department, Professor Ian Anderson, a Palawa man, has shared some heartbreaking stories of Aboriginal people who, as late as the 1960s, struggled for basic health care against prevailing attitudes of the day. While many challenges in accessing, in accessing health care remain, Ian's generation have come to expect health care as a basic right. Within the last two decades, the Indigenous mortality rate from circul circulatory disease, the leading cause of Indigenous deaths, has declined by 43 per cent. Within the same period, the Indigenous infant mortality rate has more than halved. More Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students are enrolling in university than ever before, around 18,000 at last count, and around two-thirds of them are women. For university graduates from an Indigenous background, the employment gap has closed. And it's worth reflecting on that. The employment gap has closed through the traditional route of building human capital via education. Now, none of this is to downplay the challenge faced by Indigenous Australians as a group. But I believe we're now at an inflection point, looking back on some successes, but looking ahead to some continuing challenges, the solutions of which are decidedly less clear. Now this takes me back to the second of my three observations, which is essentially the need for a more nuanced analysis of the challenges facing Indigenous Australia. At times I find myself puzzling over whether it's intellectual sloppiness or some subtle form of discrimination that means we hardly ever seem to ask the questions that should come naturally to economists. For example, where is the analysis of whether Indigenous disadvantage in a place like Western Sydney reflects indigeneity or simple poverty? Does disadvantage in some places reflect remoteness rather than indigeneity? Yes, poverty experienced by Indigenous people is ines inescapably contextual. It's informed by a unique set of social and historical dimensions. But my sense is that in parts of our country, people are disadvantaged because they're poor, not necessarily because they're Indigenous. If that's right, and I'd love to see evidence either for or against the hypothesis, it's another reason for us not to despair, for us not to fall into the deficit mind trap. We have to carefully understand between these social processes, though, that lead us 
into entrenched poverty, how best to realise economic opportunities. But we know the things that keep people locked in poverty and we know how to help people exit that cycle. So it's not as if those challenges are unknown or intractable. But what it does say is we may need interventions that are different to those which we have historically directed towards Indigenous Australia and particularly towards remote Indigenous Australia. I think the task for the APS in general and for my department in particular is to differentiate between the sources of challenge and disadvantage and to recognise the diversity in both aspiration and need across the country. Now we cannot do this with a one-size-fits-all approach, which is why working with empowered communities on place-based solutions has to be a key part of our response. But at the same time, as Nugget Coombs recognised 50 years ago, the policies aimed at Indigenous Australians must ultimately be mainstreamed. All agencies, not just those directly dealing with Aboriginal affairs, should be well equipped to develop policy alongside Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Now, I agree with Coombs when he said that, but let me be clear, this is not an argument to go back to the old model of decentralising support for Indigenous Australians across many departments in such small amounts that thinking about Indigenous Australia becomes just an afterthought. Getting the balance right is a major challenge for the APS, and while in essence Coombs's view has stood the test of time, the manner in which it has been applied has rested on perpetually shifting sands. In 50 years, Commonwealth Administration of Indigenous Affairs has cycled through 21 different ministers and through 11 different structures under them. 10 of the 11 structures have occurred in the last 30 years. Now this pace, pace, sorry, this pace of change places us out of step with other Westminster style democracies like Canada, where changes to the machinery of government are far less common. And the constant churn has presented, in economic, cost, sorry, in economic terms, significant opportunity costs. And that includes the impact on the transfer of knowledge and capability from one generation of public servants to the next. Relationships of trust and good faith can take many years to build and are often anchored to the commitment of a particular community and particular groups of public servants. Yet those relationships risk becoming collateral damage in a culture of constant movement. So my take out here is that any future government considering the mach a machinery of government change of Indigenous affairs needs to be confident it will result in better outcomes for Indigenous Australians. But we cannot let ourselves believe that that therefore means that the Indigenous Affairs Group of PM&C or a future portfolio body or a future department of Indigenous Affairs is the only place that's responsible. We have to go back to Coombs' view and remind ourselves and to remind our colleagues of their responsibilities to mainstream service delivery in ways that make it accessible for all groups in our country, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Now, I, our current centralised structure has, in my view, lifted the efficiency of the way in which we service Indigenous Australians. Whether it has lifted the effectiveness of our engagement is something I'd like to reflect on now. It may sound like an abstract issue, but it goes to the heart of the skills we need in our public service. And that is our repeated preference for a certain type of policy making in Indigenous affairs, one of which has placed most of its focus on technical solutions. What do I mean by technical? Is policy informed by a straightforward almost mechanistic relationship between input and output. Government pulls this lever over here and the outcomes improve over there. Now, Australia has an enviable reputation in policy making of this kind. The marked morbidity and mortality improvements we've seen in the Northern Territory are great examples. 
as is the Indigenous procurement policy, which adjusted the Commonwealth procurement rules to send a proportion of government's multi-million dollar annual procurement spend towards Indigenous goods and services. In the first two years of that policy, total Commonwealth procurement from Indigenous businesses rose well over $500 million. That's an astonishing 46-fold year-on-year increase compared to before the year the scheme started. That's great. But not all policy problems are so amenable to technical solutions as these have been. 50 years on from when Prime Minister Holt's Council of Aboriginal Affairs, led by Coombs, first turned their, first turned their collective mind to these issues, I wonder whether the policy successes we've achieved in health, higher education, the extension of land rights, support for Indigenous business, are concentrated in those areas that lend themselves to these technical instrumental responses. Because if we're honest, we haven't made anywhere near as much headway in addressing intergenerational disadvantage, trauma and despair, or in managing their impacts on health, wealth and participation. In our attempt to forge ahead with dependable technical responses, I wonder whether we've missed the obvious, that the underlying complexities in Indigenous affairs requires transformation in our own practice on our, and in our own leadership. The challenge we face, really, is an adaptive one, not a technical one. Adaptive in the sense that it will require constant revision and reflection and an ongoing reassessment of the way we have typically gone about addressing difficult policy problems in the past. As I mentioned in my Dungala Kayala oration last year, if we are truly to do things with and not to communities, we need relationships of trust. For the public service, that means we need to let go. By that, I don't mean handballing the problem and sitting back to observe success or failure. Rather, truly participating with communities and developing shared approaches to agreed problems. But for that to succeed, I think we also have to shift our mindset in another way. As Chris Sara has said, we've never really pursued policies predicated on high expectations of Indigenous Australians. Indeed, I personally think part of the default to the social welfare lens is a reflection of low expectations. So I would therefore like to see an APS that honour not only engages with communities as equals, but which has high expectations of what communities can do, which are matched by the community's high expectations of us. Now, both Indigenous communities and public servants require a much more sophisticated engagement with data if we are to work effectively together which is the second issue flown from the referendum that I'd like to discuss tonight. As Indigenous rights campaigner, the late Chica Dixon said of the pre-67 times, and I quote, the government counted everything. They counted the cattle, the cars, the TVs, but they didn't count us. It's like we were invisible, unquote. For the first time, the referendum gave Indigenous Australians statistical visibility. Over the decades since, the ABS has built a clear picture of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's lives and experience. Today, we have access to one of the most developed data collection systems in the world. In part, due to closing the gap, we've also seen significant improvements in the standardisation of data collection over the past 10 years. A clear example of this is in the Indigenous status across Commonwealth and state and territory surveys and administrative data sets such as the census, Medicare, hospitals and perinatal data. Yet while there are pockets of good practice, indeed world leading practice, especially in the health area, many gaps remain. One of them is employment. Despite the fact that employment is a closing the gap priority we still do not collect annual employment data for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Governments also hold extensive longitudinal administrative data sets, of which we currently make very little. Now, 
I'm an economist, uh, an applied economist. So to me, data is gold when it comes to policy development and implementation. Careful use of that administrative data can help us better understand the pathways for individuals and families and communities who are vulnerable to persistent or intergenerational disadvantage. It allows us to track what happens to individuals and cohorts over time. So why aren't we using it? What's stopping us from actually taking that step to draw that data into the policy development um, space? Well, I'm going to leave that as a question. As a statement, it's not enough to simply collect data. We also have more work to do in how we democratise its use, getting it into the hands of the people who make the decisions on the ground. Professor Maggie Walter from the University of Tasmania talks about the idea that statistics are inescapably human artefacts with, quote, configurations and meanings drawn from the dominant social norms and the values of the hierarchy of the society in which they are created, unquote. And she gives us a practical example to explain this. If you Google the search term Indigenous statistics, what you get falls under what Professor Walter calls the five Ds. Data on disparity, deprivation, disadvantage, dysfunction and difference. The deficit mindset at work yet again. If you're after Indigenous specific data on any social trend that doesn't fall within those five categories, you're going to have a hard time finding it. The fact that the division of domestic labour is much more egalitarian in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander households than in non-Indigenous households, for example, is very interesting. But it doesn't fall into the current statistical terrain, so it and great data like it are buried. Now, it's hard to ignore the untapped opportunity here. There's so much scope to understand our data better, use it to paint a more nuanced picture of Indigenous life and its challenges, tailor our policy and program responses to place and demography, and most crucially, to move away from a broad brushstroke disadvantage lens. There's also scope to move past the idea that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are stakeholders to be consulted in development of data strategy. If our approach is to be genuinely place-based, we need to build data capability into Indigenous leadership. As part of our refresh of Closing the Gap, we're looking at how First Australians can be fully engaged in the development, design and delivery of higher quality granular data. And we're keen to encourage a much richer use of regional level data to inform decision making at the local level. We'll take our cues from projects like the Longitudinal Study of Indigenous Children, which since 2008 has engaged local Indigenous interviewers to undertake data collections themselves. This approach is a significant departure from the way in which we've developed policy in the past. It recognises that government doesn't have all the answers. And even when we do have the answers, or what we think are the answers, we don't have any way of assessing their veracity. It's the approach we're starting to take with empowered communities and in the Murdy Parkey region in New South Wales, giving local leaders local data as a platform for them to assess local priorities and make local investment decisions. Without devolving analysis of the data to the people who need to make decisions on the ground and moving away from our reliance on technical solutions, we will simply not make the progress in Indigenous affairs at the rate that our community expects. So to conclude, the challenge for the next 50 years requires a genuine commitment to learning new ways and forging deeper relationships. It means being prepared to scrutinise ourselves and the values and assumptions that inform our practice as public servants. When Mick Dodson gave his, this talk over two decades ago, he lamented that, quote, Indigenous peoples had rarely come into a genuine relationship with non-Indigenous peoples. Because a relationship requires two, not just one and its mirror, unquote. We need to step outside of our habits, our assumptions and our institutional norms 
and closer to what Martin Nakata calls the cultural interface, the place where the different knowledge systems interact. This isn't necessarily a comfortable place to be, but it's one we need to enter if we're to truly succeed in ensuring Indigenous Australians have the same opportunities, the same economic empowerment and the same cultural and social health as the rest of our community. As such, it's too important for the APS to not embrace this challenge. Thank you.